to our Q&A with Julien Baudemont, Principal Flute of the Orchestra of National Opera of Lyon, and previously Principal Flute of the LA Philharmonic Orchestra. Uh, Julien studied at Guildhall and Paris Conservatoire and is now Professor at Lyon Conservatoire. Welcome, Julien. Hello, everybody. Hello, Camilla. Brilliant to have you here. Thank yeah, you thank very, you very much, much for joining us. Um, so we've had quite a lot of questions sent in ready for Julian. And if you have any anyone watching this who has any extra questions, please comment below on Facebook and we'll be able to see those questions and then we can answer those live for you. So shall we get stuck straight in? And our first question for you today is what is the most efficient way to prepare for a concert program? Well, uh, it's, I would say it's a private question because it all depends on you. Um, the best way for me won't be the best way for you, for example. So um, I would say that, for example, I'm a kind of person who likes to be ready uh, very early. And then with the time, I'm trying to get rid of it a little bit. Get rid, I mean, you know, you know what I mean. But um, I'm not the person who is going to work very much just after the concert or the competition. Um, often I say to my students that um, when they're doing competition auditions, um, they sometimes they ask them, how are you working, you know? And then I like to work before the, the, the day, on the day, etc. And I said, you know what? You should sleep a little bit. Mm -hmm. But sleeping can be much useful than uh, working like three hours doing a concert or an audition, etc. So <clears throat> again, I'm sorry not to answer very precisely to your question, but it depends on you. And the good thing is to know what you need, what is good for you. I think the most important is to arrive on a good shape physically. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if working a lot before makes you tired and if you arrive tired on the concert, on your audition is not good mm -hmm. because we are doing also a physical instrument right um so we need to be in, in a good shape so you need to know your body you know you need to know your limits etc um and for example uh, what i say to my students is that the day of the audition concert just warm up but without the sound for example right so you get rid of the sound you don't have any pressure on the lips and you just blow in your flute, you can play your Tafen and Gober scales without getting tired with the sound. Mm. But if you need to be in contact with the instrument, because in fact you're scared that uh, I haven't been in contact with my flute since two hours, <laughs> uh, it's like bicycle. You will <laughs> you won't forget it before playing, of course. Mm -hmm. So I think the best is again to to arrive in a good shape and not to get too tired. Yeah. <clears throat> Excellent. Um, our next question is, how do you find the responsiveness of your Sankyo flute? And that question is from Ron. Hi, Ron. The responsiveness. So I'm, I think you mean, uh, I mean, technically or about the, about the mechanism, etc. Yeah, I think probably everything. Well, I'm very happy. I'm playing Sankyo since uh, <laughs> for 25 years now. Mm. Uh, I, you, you can see that I'm a very faithful, faithful man with the instrument I'm playing. <laughs> Um, I have two flutes. I have the, the gold flute behind me and I have a wooden flute. Mm -hmm. And the responsiveness is so different from the two instruments. Mm -hmm. I play, for example, the wooden flute um, because the tube is uh, bigger, thicker. Uh, the mechanism is very easy, but at the same time, super slow. So mm -hmm. I like to play it when it's not too difficult. Okay. Mm -hmm. And if it has to be super difficult, I always take uh, the security on the gold flute because maybe also maybe I started with a normal flute actually. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm more used to, to use this instrument. Mm -hmm. But I would say um, I'm very happy, of course. You know what? Now, I mean, you find gold flutes everywhere. Mm -hmm. Of course, I love some cute flutes because I, I play them. If I didn't like them, I wouldn't mm -hmm. play them. But uh, I always say that uh, they're not bad instruments, they're always bad players. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and now you can find some fantastic flutes for not so expensive but of course uh, it's a luxury instrument which i have but uh, yes i mean on the wooden flute you will always find different responsiveness with the mechanism for mm -hmm. sure. and what about do you find a difference in the articulation responsiveness of the two instruments as well uh, yes of course the articulation on the wooden flute is a bit more precise 
uh-huh. um, less powerful, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, I have to say that I use more and more my wooden flute. Uh-huh. Maybe because I need a detox. <laughs> Maybe also because the, go- the gold flute is asking you to play more all the time. Mm-hmm. And uh, sometimes when I take the wooden flute, Let's say that, for example, I will play for one month in the opera. I will play something really big, Shostakovich opera, for example, and I need a strong instrument with a very good responsiveness instrument. So I, I take the gold flute. And there is, there is always a moment I need to, to do a detox. Mm-hmm. And the, the, the wooden flute is, in fact, um, the, just the contrary of the other instrument. If you force the instrument, it doesn't, it doesn't respond at all. You need to play it like a detox, like something which is easy on the easy side and on the very flexible side of the instrument. So I like to, to jump from one to the other. So I think it, it's a luxury which I have, of course, to, to try both. But uh, yes, there is a difference. Of course, a big difference. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's really interesting. I don't know many flute players um, who play both interchangeably like that, wooden and gold. It's a, Do you one I mean, or the other? Yes. Uh, again, if you have the habit to change, I mean, mm-hmm. some people, for example, I mean, uh, uh, watch Rachel Brown, for example, she can switch to any flute. Yeah. And for me, it's absolutely not a problem to switch from this flute to a wooden flute with a modern mechanism. But she, she switches from the baroque flute to the normal flute. It's absolutely amazing. And I will never be able to do that. So for <laughs> me, doing what I'm doing is absolutely nothing. <laughs> yeah. Great, thank you. And thank you, Ron, for that question. Uh, next question. Actually, two people asked quite similar questions um, next. So we had Veronica asking, um, what advice would you give to someone who is starting their musical musical career later in life? And Ludo also asked, could you please address the thoughts on starting to play the flute at an older age? I, he says, I started at the age of 50 and practiced about two to three hours daily. I realize I'll probably never reach the level where I can audition for an orchestra, but so I'd like to have your thoughts on how age and physique has an impact on the de- development curve of acquiring technique. <clears throat> okay, uh, speaking about the first question, for example, um, I don't know the age of this lady, right? No, it doesn't say. Yeah. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. All right, I thought it yeah. was a girl. Yeah. Um, I don't know the age, mm-hmm. but starting a career, a later career with instrument, um, I don't know which career he or she wants to make. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have to know that making a career in brackets uh, takes years. Mm-hmm. I, I started to play music at six and I started to play the flute at 12. So it took me years and it can take a life, right? So um, a musical career is not also about uh, playing the instrument. It was, it's also about making uh, auditions, contacts, etc., etc. Et so, actually, um, it all depends on what you need as a career, first. I mean, if you want to start to be a flute teacher, well, you have to, to play the flute for years and then to start to teach what you have learned from years, for, for, for years, sorry. Mm. So, it takes very, very, very long. Right. So when you start very late, so I don't know about the age again, uh, but late can be actually uh, 25. OK, uh, mm-hmm. when you start late, um, you have to know that it, it will be even more difficult because when you start young, you have the physique, the physical abilities to start young, etc., and to build something. And then you have to know that the more you're getting old, the more it's difficult to play an instrument, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, so if starting late to make a career, um, I mean, starting late be, to do a career or starting late to just to play the flute for fun, mm-hmm. I would always choose the second option, of course. Mm-hmm. But again, it depends. Uh, I, I had some students who were quite old when they entered and they did amazing at the end. So. But you have to be careful, okay? Uh, it's not a career like uh, you don't have a degree, like, uh, well, let's say that you want to change your career and you want to study law, you, you study, then after years, you build your cabinet uh, and uh, you, you can uh, be a lawyer. It's different. It's much, complica- much more complicated than this. Yeah. And uh, to the, ad- the other person who says um, that, that he's 50, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he's asking, how, 
how much time should he work? Well, he, he like, said he currently practices at uh, for two to three hours a day and that he realizes he will never play professionally, so to speak. Um, but that he was wondering your thoughts on how age and physique has an impact on the development curve of acquiring technique. Well, the first thing he, ha uh, he has to ask himself is why is he playing the flute again? I mean, um, if, he, if he's 50 and he uh, wants to be a professional or just to enjoy the, the beauty of the instrument first, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, it's like, I mean, it's like me when I will be 50, I will decide that, for example, I would love to be, I don't know, a, 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 a soccer player or whatever, you know, maybe that's too late, of course, but I know. Mm -hmm. So you have to realize that also there are things which are possible and things which are not, okay? Mm -hmm. But then about the practice, for example, um, and I always say this as well to my students, that if you work two, three hours in a row, it's very tiring, mm -hmm. whatever your age, actually. Okay, if you drive for two hours, you will be uh, feeling very tired, so you need a break. Mm. And I think for the concert, no one can be uh, concentrated more than two hours. It's impossible. Mm. That's why actually they ask you to stop every two hours when you drive. Okay, mm. but if you uh, divide the work, like maybe three times one hour, for example, it's much more efficient for the concentration, for your progress, improvements, etc., and for your physique. Okay. I used to have one student, for example, who is now in a very nice orchestra, but um, it's just a little story, so it, it's very interesting. And uh, every time he was arriving in the lesson, he was feeling so tired physically. I mean, he was like, sore lips, etc. And, and after a few weeks, I said, why are you so tired when you arrive the lesson? And I asked him, but how do you practice? And I, and, and I said, please tell me the story. Mm -hmm. How do you practice every day? And he told me that uh, most of the time he was waking up at 12. Breakfast or lunch, mm. maybe lunch at 12. And then starting the day to practice at mm. 2. And again, and until uh, 8 or 9 p.m. So he was doing almost like, I don't know, six hours, seven hours in a row. Mm. And in fact, physically, he was so tired because it's impossible. You're asking too much to your body. Mm. And so... I said, no, you cannot do that anymore. I mean, you have to do like two hours in the morning, two hours in the afternoon, and two hours maybe later, for example. But for the mm -hmm. concentration and the physics, it's impossible. Yeah. So uh, I think it's just a matter of organizing because he's 50, he might, he might do another work, for example. So mm -hmm. maybe to divide the work in a, in, a, in a few places so he can save himself uh, to work more in the, into the week. Yeah. Yeah. And do you think um, that uh, as you get older, do you think it's harder to uh, acquire or finesse um, flute technique? Is it something you learn, things easier to learn when it's younger? Or as you get older, do you think it's easier because you understand it better? It's a good question. I would say that the, the fear changes. <laughs> the fear changes. Yeah. When I was 20, I was playing stuff uh, fearless. Mm -hmm. And now the same thing that I would, I would have to play was like, mm, no, maybe <laughs> not. And there are things I was doing when I was 20, which um, I couldn't do when, when I was 20 and I can do, for example. Yeah. Um, I have to say that I'm less now in a, in a mood of showing. Because when you're young, you want to show your finger, <laughs> your abilities. So I'm more into the mood of discovering new pieces with a beautiful harmony and some pieces which have been never played, etc. So okay. uh, playing Shandy Nose, for example, and recitals, it's not my cup of tea anymore because I did it. Because I did it because I thought that I had to do it. Mm -hmm. And because you have to do it. Are you young? You have to play this, Jolie Concerto, yeah. Shandy Nose, this and this, and you play it. And sometimes you have bad souvenirs, okay? Mm -hmm. Now I'm free. So I don't want to spend my life playing things which I don't like or which I've already done. And I think I'm still playing because I love them. But again, I think the, the, the technical side is more psychological. Mm -hmm. So, um, and it also depends of what you do in your job. For example, the, 
the sight reading, the technical problems when you sight read, or the the automatic technique as a, an orchestra musician, mm. it's much easier for me, of course, after 20 years of orchestra, mm. which something which was something so difficult when I was young mm -hmm. to play like a uh, Rosen Cavalier like this. For mm. me, it's my job, in fact. So it, it's I don't feel the fear. Okay, mm -hmm. but again, playing a super big concerto uh, for a long time. It's maybe not for me. So but, but some people like them, like like to do it as well. So I'm just speaking about me. Yeah. And I, I think the technical side is changing with the years. And I think maybe because you get, uh, I mean, you have the distance with the things, you use more music to play with a better technique. Yeah. This is for me what I feel. Mm -hmm. When I was young, I was just a bad technique. My teacher told me, please, music first. Mm -hmm. of course she, she was right and of course now it's always what i say to my students again uh, music first use the music to help the fingers yeah yeah but you need to you need to get old <laughs> brilliant thank you for that question ludo <laughs> Um, to those people watching, just a reminder that um, please do comment below the Facebook video and with your questions so that Julien can answer those um, live for you. Um, but for now, we now have a question from Millie, and that is, do you find there was, did you find there was a cultural or musical change when you moved between working with the LA Phil, Leon Opera and BBC now? And how did you adapt to this? Of course, there are big differences, and this is what is what is fantastic mm -hmm. uh, to to be part of a world which is so different. We play the same music but differently. Sometimes mm -hmm. not, but I mean, it's it's the good thing. Um, I won't say what is the best between uh, because I live in Great Britain, I live in America, and I live in France. Mm -hmm. uh, again, I like to say that, but um, every time people t to ask me. Uh, what did you prefer between Los Angeles and living in France? I said, what I prefer between France and America is the Atlantic Ocean, right? <laughs> there are things which I love there and things which I, which I hate in France and, mm. and of course the, the opposite. Um, what For me, if I would say that technically what was different uh, to play in America, for, uh, for example, in France, that the vibrato, the use of vibrato, we have a we use the vibrato here in France in a very uh, smooth way that the expression is not only based on the vibrato, but based on uh, how you shape the line. Mm -hmm. Okay, And then the vibrato is a tool to help to make the line more expressive or whatever. But also there are some people who play with a lot of vibrato and they think they are expressive, but they're not because the line stays completely flat. Uh -huh. So the vibrato was for me the the big difference, right? Uh, especially with the American oboe vibrato, which is very tense. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and in France, for example, um, the strings will be uh, less good than in America, mm -hmm. compared to the woodwind, for example. Mm -hmm. But at the end, uh, yes, it's so complex. Um, maybe in America, uh, it, it's faster to work there mm -hmm. than in France <laughs> because, <we're French. laughs> because we take two hours to eat lunch. That's why. <laughs> um, also in Great Britain, because I used to have a, to be principal at the BBC Welsh. Mm -hmm. uh, now it's a long time ago. Um, it was a bit the same, working very, very fast. Um, and also because I, I am in an opera house, so we. we rehearse a lot with the singers mm -hmm. um the the english brass for me are absolutely amazing mm -hmm. for me it's a i'm a huge fan of english brass mm -hmm. um and then in the work uh, is different france will be more direct yeah they will tell you the things more directly than in great britain mm -hmm. in america uh they will be also kind of direct even if they are more direct, uh, not on stage, mm. but uh, backstage, for example. Yeah. Uh, but again, uh, I was super happy to to be in Great Britain or America. Then I choose France for personal reasons mm -hmm. that some people know. Uh, mm. But um, 
I had a fantastic time uh, in Los Angeles, for example. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> I, um, out of interest, what was the schedule like between the three? Was one of them sort of more hours a day? Were they more? Were some more busy than others? <sighs> it's a good question because uh, Cardiff was like uh, sixteen years ago now. So. <laughs> remember and uh, Los Angeles was like now uh, almost like uh, six years ago mm -hmm. I remember that in Los Angeles I had like four concerts a week uh -huh. every week mm. Thursday Friday Saturday Sunday afternoon mm. Monday off sometimes <laughs> uh, and then uh, so it was pretty intense yeah um, as a principal put in America uh, you are the only principal you have a co-principal and then you can share also uh, what you the amount of work so it's yeah. very often that the co-principal plays the first half and you play the second half so which is like a twice less work uh, in the wheel so but that was really really intense really intense in America <clears throat> can't remember really well in in Cardiff and in France it's a bit more I mean, it's, it's much lighter than in America of course um, and because in an opera orchestra you are uh, completely, um, I mean, uh, you have to be with the singers, you have to work with the singers, so they cannot work every day. So once you just play the rehearsals for one week, 10 days maximum, then you enter the performance two week, for two weeks, for example, and you can play once every two days, for example. If, if it's Wagner, it's once every three days. Mm -hmm. um, so the schedule, is a, the schedule is a bit lighter in, in France, of course, mm -hmm. but it's an opera orchestra, so you cannot compare as well. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Um, we have a live question just come in from Ron. Uh, I'll just show that on the screen there. And he says, do you ever play jazz flute um, a la Jeremy Steig? No. No? A la Jeremy Steig, no. A la Julien Baudimont, no. <laughs> I have no <laughs> talent at all to play jazz flute. Uh, <laughs> I think it's one of the most difficult things to, to, to do, to learn, to achieve. Mm -hmm. And I have no talent for that. <laughs> Maybe also because I had no, ne <laughs> I had no time to work on this. Mm -hmm. I have a very good student in my in first year student, Fanny, in my class, who is also uh, doing jazz in another conservatory in Lyon, and she is absolutely amazing, really. Mm -hmm. uh, Fanny Martin, she's mm -hmm. on Facebook, and she she posts very often some videos of her improvising. But for me, no, it's impossible. It's uh, <laughs> it's like a a huge harmony uh, mm. uh, mountain for me. Yeah. If the harmony is like a normal jazz, like a key sweet, I could, but I will, I will, I will feel ashamed to do it. Really. <laughs> yeah, you got enough to do. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you, Ron, for that question. Uh, now we have one from Kevan, and they ask, may I assume? You know most of the tricky flute bits from orchestral excerpts, but is there much more besides? And of course, there's always the premiere of contemporary piece to challenge. So basically, do you, are there more tricky bits than we're used to finding in audition excerpts? It's true that I have played <coughs> the, um, most of the excerpts, uh, whether it's in symphonic repertoire or opera repertoire. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are always things which are always always more difficult to to discover. For example, one of the most difficult things I've ever played was uh, Pogge and Bess, the opera. Okay. It's a nightmare. Yeah. Because uh, the right, right hand of the keyboard uh, is the flute part, for example. So it's wrong chromatism, it's, and the score is like this. It, it, it's, it lasts for four hours, so it's <laughs> quite difficult. And then some unknown composers, uh, or of course, prim premiere of contemporary works, which are, can be difficult. But yes, I've played most of the excerpts, um, and then there's no glory about that when you are playing in orchestra since 20 years. Uh, mm -hmm. That's normal, I would say. Mm -hmm. what, what would be not normal is that I would have never played all the excerpts. Mm -hmm. um, and the second part of the question was about modern. Uh, yeah, so um, uh, as well as excerpts, um, the premiering contemporary pieces, do you come up across many challenges with that sort of new contemporary music? Yes, it, it can be challenging. Sometimes the composers write stuff and they don't even know if it's possible on the flute. Uh, um, what is challenging, I think, is, um, and again, 
I'm not used to this contemporary modern stuff, for example, because in an opera you play Puccini, Verdi, Rossini, Mozart, Tchaikovsky, etc. Sometimes you are you make you doing premiere, mm. um, and again, it's it all depends of your job. My teacher Sophie Cherrier, who is uh, at yeah, the Ensemble Inter Contemporain since more than 30 years. For her, playing Boulez, sat reading uh, Matthias Pincher, it's normal life for her. Mm -hmm. Okay, and th this will be a nightmare for me. And it will take me like ages before, I mean, I will take the part uh, and practice it really, 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 really a lot before the first rehearsal. And she mm -hmm. told me that, for example, playing in an Offenbach opera or a Verdi opera where it's the key, the harmony changes almost sometimes every line will be a nightmare because they don't have that, for example, in modern music. <laughs> There's no uh, like two sharps or three flats, just <laughs> like, uh, you know, you see the notes and the, sh and the alteration, so you do it. So yeah. it all depends again. And mm -hmm. she, when she told me my worst nightmare is to play an open back, uh, <laughs> I was like, really? <laughs> yeah. So it depends on everyone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. What's the most um, challenging piece you've come across recently that's been new for you? Can you can you think of anything? I mean, well, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to <laughs> to to practice a piece she just recorded, which is called Beyond mm -hmm. by Matthias Pincher, and it's extremely difficult. So that's that's going to, to be a challenge. Mm. I have to say it's going to take me at least six months to do it. Mm. So if we are locked down again, <laughs> it, it will be faster. Yeah, but um, it's very challenging, very yeah. very challenging. And in the orchestra, because the orchestra was shut down for so long, mm. uh, I think really the most difficult thing I've played before. Oh yes, there's one horrible thing I've just played. The last last most horrible thing I played was in October, and it's of course William Tell by Rossini, but not the overture, because the overture, of course, everybody plays it, mm -hmm. I've worked it, fine. But if you play the whole opera, mm. there's the ballet music. And the ballet music is always cut. <laughs> because then the opera is too long. But we did with the ballet music in Europe. And there is two, there are two pages of a flute solo, which is like a Mercadante concerto. <laughs> really. And that is like, you know what? They told us, okay, you're going to play. I mean, I've, I've seen that I'm going to play William Tell. I've played it certain times, but never with the ballet. Mm. And so I got that to the score, and then I tack, 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 yes, that's fine, fine, fine. And then <laughs> I like black, huh? like a yeah. black track when you ski, okay, the same. <laughs> black and black, and that is really one of the most difficult things I've ever played. The ballet music of uh, William Tell. Uh -huh. Really listen to this because it's a fantastic yeah. solo, but it's super difficult. Yeah, it makes me. I don't know it, so I have to go. And mm, nobody knows it. Nobody <laughs> knows it. It's really, really, really tough. Yeah, fantastic. Um, thank you for that question, Kevin. Uh, we have a, now a question from Phoebe. That's a live question that's just come in. Um, I'll just put it up on the screen. Her question is: How have you stayed musically inspired during quarantine? It's a very good question. Um, I'm trying not to shock you, <laughs> um, really, and to be honest. And I think there are so many musicians, actually, uh, who felt this. When you're a musician, your life is all about music most of the time. You travel, you play, you rehearse, you, you travel again and again and again. And that was the first time since 20 years, uh, the life was completely stopped mm. for three months at least. Um, <clears throat> and I have to say um, that so many, so many people say on the uh, internet that, oh, I did this, 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 and this. I didn't do much. I did some stuff, but I didn't, too, I didn't do too much. Mm -hmm. um, because uh, when you work a lot, um, you always dream to have some free time <laughs> really and mm -hmm. uh, I think we shouldn't be ashamed to say that yes I did some stuff but I didn't kill myself to do some stuff mm -hmm. and 
I would say that if you want to stay sometimes musically inspired, don't work, don't kill yourself as well. Mm. Because work can kill you, can kill the inspiration as well. So when you see someone like who says, uh, go to the museum, uh, go to the beach, etc. But of course it's good as well, mm. because it changes your mind. And then you take the flute and you have more motivation to play and to work because you feel also uh, maybe in a better shape, etc. So uh, uh, getting inspired, I don't know if 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 working makes you inspired. That's the first thing, okay? And I think the emptiness can be inspire, inspiring as well, okay? Or for example, uh, I love Philip Glass music. I love this music and uh, during most of the time I mean, I mean I listen to this music when I'm working because I feel it's emptiness mm. and I like that and it's a music which I didn't listen at all during the lockdown because it was already empty <laughs> um, so it's very interesting in a way but yes I'm practiced this piece by, by Matthias Pincher I'm did my teaching online as we're doing now on zoom and everybody knows that which was actually very tiring um <clears throat> but also i had the, the chance to be uh, to to move to the southwest by the ocean and i have to say that i have been able to to go to the beach sometimes of course it was really really regulated mm. not long etc as you know but um <laughs> i say that uh, I watch the trees growing up <laughs> in a way. So uh, you don't, you never lose the inspiration. You never lose it. Mm -hmm. Inspiration, I mean, uh, when you play music, when you take the flute, you're inspired. But again, when you play too much, when you work too much, you can, you can feel that you need a little break as well. Mm -hmm. So don't trust all the people who say, oh, yes, I did this, 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 this. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. Okay. Especially if they have kids. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. Thank you for that question, Phoebe. We've got another live question now from uh, Maxime. And his question is, what about historical flutes? Do you play a historical flute? Are you inspired by it? How does it affect your playing? Maybe you decide to play on a wooden flute because of some repertoire. Yeah. Uh, no, I never, I, I don't play on uh, historical, not hysterical, mm -hmm. <laughs> historical flutes. Mm -hmm. but, um, uh, I would have loved to, to learn. And then the, 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 the thing is that I got the job very early when I, when I was actually at the conservatory in Paris. So I was already trapped into the professional world. So I've just tried to play some historical instruments, but in fact, I did never took the time uh, and as I said it's a matter of time of course but I love it and what I love also is that um, when I teach um, Mozart concerto for example I always say that the the sound of the flute on, on in the 18th century literature should be without effort effortless and I see so many people who want to fight and to have a big sound in Mozart concerto. And I always say you have to play a strong, a very strong mezzo forte. Mm -hmm. Because this is the feeling you have on a wooden flute. And this is the thing I have a little when I take my wooden flute as well. Mm -hmm. that, that it's all about the singing, the resonance, and not about the power. Okay. Yeah. Sometimes it's about the power again, especially on the nose. But uh, what I love in instruments again is that it's um the effortless feeling of the flute, the the extension of the voice. I love this. Um, and again, uh, when we ask, uh, when Maxime asks, uh, maybe would you, you decide to play in a wooden modern flute for some repertoire? Yes, especially the 18th repertoire, which is fantastic. If you play Haydn symphony, Mozart symphony, opera, for example, it's, it's absolutely fantastic. Mm. Uh, again, as I said, it's a detox. Mm. So, um, but um, uh, I took lessons with Rachel Brown as well, and uh, I think she's really for me. She 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 taught me a lot about this about the effortless of um, 
the sound, etc., and not the the force of yeah. the of the instrument. <clears throat> yeah. Fantastic. Um, and shall we move on? So our next question is also another one from Kevan, actually. And that is, that his question is, how long do you need to prepare in order to be ready for that first rehearsal downbeat in orchestra? It depends on what you play, or what mm -hmm. I play, sorry. Mm -hmm. if, it, if it's about things which I played a thousand times, I don't need preparation. If the magic flute, for example, the traviata, or things which I've played a thousand times, you don't need to 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 practice for ages then it again if you see some Stravinsky operas mm, Shostakovich stuff mm, okay some 20th century stuff always 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 take the score um, and also there are things in, in Mozart operas for example which are still tricky which uh, which you can practice of course like if you play the 39th Symphony, uh, the final, this is quite tricky to make, so you have to, but you have to know the repertoire as well to, to do that. Uh, so after 20 years, you start to know what is dangerous and what is not. Um, when you start a career, of course, you always need to take the score before, really. Okay. Yeah. And I think it's um, if you take the score before and if you learn the score and if you listen to the CD or not the CD anymore, the MP3, sorry, if you <laughs> listen online, you are much more prepared and you will, you will feel more confident in the orchestra. And then that, that's, that's how um, you make your a good orchestra life, for example. And I know there are some young people who arrive in orchestras and they like to take the time to sight read when they arrive in the orchestra, which is completely <laughs> crazy because <laughs> Orchestras have no time, actually, and they have no time to wait for you. So you need to be ready. You need to know that if you do this solo, it starts here, there, and they are playing this, and there's a danger here. And the more you arrive prepared, the, 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 the best it is, of course. Yeah. Then with the years, of course, with the experiment, you, you know how to manage your life. And to know, uh, let's say, for, for example, here, <clears throat> we're playing Mahler. Is uh, next week's, so I've played them, so I know what is tricky in the first mm -hmm. symphony, etc. Then uh, we're playing uh, Beatrice and Benedict, which I've never played, so of course I take the score. Uh, we're playing Rossignol by Stravinsky, the opera. I've played it a lot, but I will take the score again. And mm -hmm. then it's Bartok, Bluebird, I will take the score. Uh, and then it's Werther, for example, which I've played a thousand times. I don't need the score because I know that from memory, for example, and etc. So you, you, you know uh, your Achilles uh, who, heels, you say that? Achilles, uh, you know your ha Achilles? Oh, that your Achilles heel, yeah. Yeah, yeah sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it sounds like you do quite a lot of preparation still, even yes, now. Yes, of course. Of course, because I would hate to arrive not prepared. In the orchestra and because and if you miss something you look completely stupid uh, with your colleagues mm -hmm. don't respect the music and don't, don't respect your job and the conductor so yeah. I, I, uh, you have to stay professional all your life mm. so it's normal it's my job yeah and do you think that's something that's um kind of easier to fit into the schedule in france than it maybe was in wales or um Los Angeles? Uh, i know in america I had this to prepare and to be really organized Mm -hmm. But again, in in Lyon, we're doing stagione, so we play the same thing for one month, uh -huh. which yeah. can be also very difficult physically because if you play the Rosen Cavalier, yeah, <laughs> uh, for one month, it's very very tiring. For example, mm -hmm. and if you just play for one week or three times, yeah, it's much easier. And playing ten times Rosen Cavalier in a row, mm -hmm. it's super super tiring. So there, there's no hell, mm -hmm. there's no paradise. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, I have maybe more time, of course, in Lyon to prepare for the next month as well. And I'm not playing all the operas, so of course I have more, more free time. Yeah. Still, uh, in your free time, you practice for the next thing you have. Yeah. To do. yeah. Free time is not free time, in fact. <laughs> yeah. Especially, but except in lockdown. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <clears throat> um, great. Uh, we have another question from Ron, and that is when playing Bach, I'm thinking of the slow movement of the A minor solo partita. How do you choose where to insert the appoggiaturas? 
So when he means apertures, does he mean ornamentation or? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, okay. Well, it's difficult without the fluid, but for example, um, even if it's behind, but I mean the score, mm. but they are, um, then the first thing in when you play bar, of course, and uh, please don't listen to the bar I'm playing when I was like 15 years older, uh, younger, it's shit. <laughs> so, and I had the ornamentation. Now I'm getting older. I would say I would never do that again because I think it's too much and it's, there's no meaning. But anyway, you will make mistakes when you're young. Um, mm -hmm. So I will just put the ornamentation to make the things you want to say clearer and not to show what you can add. It's not a catalog of, okay, I will do this and this like mm -hmm. uh, Chantilly, you know, or ketchup. Yeah. So that's the first thing. You on, you can only do ornamentation to make things uh, more clear. Yeah. Okay. Then uh, there are different ways of ornamentation. This is the Italian way. You know, there, are, there were three different styles at the Baroque time. The French style, the Italian style, and the German style. Mm -hmm. and the German style is the combination between the best of the French and the best of the Italians. It's very German, very practical, okay? Um, but the, the ornamentation uh, in the German style should be more French, more organized, like a garden with symmetry, for example. Mm -hmm. And if you take the ornamentation of, from the Italian style, for example, like Tartini, Vivaldi, it's like very big scale. Like you can, if you play Tartini, you have between two notes, like uh, 11 notes to play, for example. Mm -hmm. Like a guirlande or something, like a little yeah. wave, which is not so great in Bach music. Okay, so mm -hmm. it's more about something which is more, a bit more symmetric, more rhythmical, and again, uh, it doesn't have to disturb the line and to disturb um, the the dance as well. So yeah. if you play the saraband again, the saraband is the is the dance which uh, has a, a big down beat on the second beat, for example. So if you want to show the second beat, sometimes the third beat as well in the second. But if you want to show the third or the second beat, you have to maybe to do an annotation on the second beat and not on the first beat. So they won't, nobody will understand that it's a dance which has something strong on the second beat, for example. Mm -hmm. So you always have to help the listener to understand better what is going on. Yeah. And it's not about what you can do, it's what you can do for the music to be more clear. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Um... Thank you for that question, Ron. That's a really interesting answer, actually. Thank you, Julian. We have another live question here um, from Alexandra. And um, she says... Uh, I know her. Yeah, I know her as well. <laughs> Salut, Alexandra. Yeah. Long time no see. <laughs> uh, she asks, how do you stay in shape when your, your time for practicing is limited? What exercises do you practice? Or good prior question. Very good question because uh, when you when you're professional, that the time is limited, so you have to do something which is very efficient. Uh, what I like to do, <laughs> again, the two Bibles I have is the um, Tafel and Gobert. Mm -hmm. Okay, I will do the the third and the sixth, for example, number uh, seven, and up that higher, for example. And I love the book Mechanism and Combatism by Moise, which is hell. <laughs> so, so effective for the technique. Mm -hmm. So if I have one hour, I will do one hour of scales or mm -hmm. one hour of Moise, uh, Combatism or 480 exercises, for example. Mm -hmm. If I have two hours, maybe I will do a study. But I think to, to keep the shape when you don't have time is to... I, it's, it's what I think, what I do, is to, to focus on the technique. Mm -hmm. Because, and again, it all depends on everyone. There's something I don't lose, for, it's the sound. If I go on vacation for two, three weeks, uh, the sound is going back in two days, not a problem. Mm -hmm. What I lose very quickly is the technique. Mm -hmm. And so pe some people, is the opposite for them. So you have to know what you're losing more if you don't have time to practice. So if it's the sound, you can play sound, uh, vocalise, yeah. arpeggios, something legato, etc. If you lose the technique, play some technique. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. 
Um, thank you, and lovely to hear from Alexandra. There. Alexandra. Maybe I will see you one day. <laughs> um, <clears throat> great. Now we have another question from Millie. Uh, she says, what made you decide to come to the UK to study at Guildhall? And also, what was it like studying in the famous flute class of the Paris Conservatoire? It's a good question. And uh, I always like to do things that people uh, won't do, for example. And when you are French living in France, um, I remember when I was saying that I'm going to Great Britain to study flute, I said, <laughs> why are you living in France? You have the best school, which I think is not, but anyway, this is just my point of view. <laughs> uh, so you should stay there. And I said, no, I want to see uh, what's going on uh, outside France, okay? And in fact, uh, I know there was a fantastic teacher called Paul Edmund Davis at that time, who is still a fantastic teacher. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wanted to, to meet him and to, to play for him. And I met him and I really loved the way he was teaching and I did the audition. And I think, again, it's, it's not about going to a country, it's to, to follow someone who makes you inspired, for example. And I... I really love Paul and I really love the, I have learned also so much because it's, it was very different from, from what I was hearing in my country. And uh, I've always been curious and what I hate is to be in my comfort zone. Mm -hmm. For me, it's boring. So going to Great Britain when you're 18 uh, to, to practice, to play, to work in, in, with different styles was for me uh, super interesting. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, uh, um, being at the Paris Conservatory uh, was also fantastic with Sophie Cherrier. And uh, if you if you see the, um, the all the teachers who have been there, Rampal, um, De Bost, Anna Marion, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, it's it's something which is also very big. And um, so I couldn't say what I prefer most uh, between France and London. I, mean, I love them because they were very different. Mm -hmm. um, I think in London it was more about um, how to play an orchestra, how to play each other music, how to play together. And in Paris was a bit more, even if it's less actually now, but at that maybe it was still a bit uh, to be a, a soloist or the repertoire, etc. So mm -hmm. I think I was lucky to have both mm. sides of the instrument. Yeah, and um, I could say to some people who are listening to me, that uh, living abroad makes you make uh, more improvements as well, because you're abroad, you're not in your country. It can be tough, it can be hard, so you can focus more on the instrument as well. Uh, so the thing I did going to London, Guildhall, and then to the Paris Conservatoire mm. was for me so good. And uh, if I had to do it again, I would do the same, for sure. Mm. And teaching in Lyon, because Lyon is the, you have two big conservatories in France, and the Conservatoire National Supérieure de Paris and the Conservatoire mm. Supérieure de Lyon. Uh, teaching there after Philippe Bernol and Maxence Larieux was also for me the, a big achievement. So, um, yes, I mean, um, you have to follow someone you like mm. and not a, a degree. In a, you can have, a, uh, you can live in a fantastic place and have a very cheap teacher. <laughs> That's useless. If you if you um, if you in, if you play the if you have a fantastic teacher in a shit place, go to see that guy, even mm. if it's in a shit place. Mm. Sorry, I'm very vulgar, but I can be because I'm French and I like to swear in English. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you would you say you encourage your any of your pupils to yes do Erasmus or yes to... I do, but they're very French. They don't want to move a lot. <laughs> That's the problem. They, they feel so good in France and I want to go outside, go outside as possible, but it's very hard. Yeah. So every year I'm trying to make them uh, hey, go away, kill the father, <laughs> kill the father. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And how do you feel um, teaching at um, Lyon Conservatoire? Do you notice a difference between the French teaching now compared to what you experienced at Paris Conservatoire? Um, well, I love to teach in Lyon for sure. The building is beautiful. I love the team. Um, so I feel really, really well there and I have a very good class. Of course, the level is super high. Mm -hmm. Maybe there are some who are listening, so maybe high or maybe <laughs> or they are partying and they shouldn't. 
but uh, yes, it's a. Uh, the thing is, when I was in America, they called me the French flute player, but in France, I'm not renowned, if I could say, of a French flute player. Mm. I'm more into uh, a flute player who has uh, worked in America and in Great Britain. So, <laughs> it's, what is French in a way? So, I don't know. Um, uh, maybe it's, I mean, I teach what I learned. So, maybe it's not different from what I learned in Paris, of course. So, yeah. she told me this and I tell the same things. Yeah. Same things. I mean, the different worlds, of course, and with some maybe some differences. But mm -hmm. you are what you have been taught, of course. So I would say, no, there's no difference. But also there are differences. And I think what is the big difference is that um, it's the population of the conservatory. Because mm -hmm. there are, I, mean, I have 12 students. The full class is 12 students. And more, half, maybe more than a half of the class is foreigners. Mm -hmm. So Portuguese, uh, Korean, Taiwanese, uh, because remember Danish, so many, so many, so many different uh, English. I have an English girl from Guildo who, who went to do the audition and she, she got in. So uh, half of the class mm. is uh, from abroad. So they bring in their sound. Yeah. And I'm trying to not to change their sound, but to add to their sound something which I learned as well. So yeah. it's the globalization. Of the sound of course the style might stay very very french about the vibrato of course the way you shape the phrase etc mm. but uh, the sound is starting to be quite homogene everywhere yeah yeah <clears throat> and um what was it that made you <laughs> um decide to go to to move to la and join the la phil well <laughs> i have to say that i didn't decide uh, once I, I got an I got an email from the LA field um, asking me uh, um, we're organizing a fruit audition and uh, we have seen uh, your videos on YouTube and we liked it and uh, would you like to do the audition? Mm. And I was very surprised and uh, <laughs> I thought it was a joke first. <laughs> <laughs> And um, and the audition was quite different because they, I think, I don't know, I mean, people they invited to do that, but you had to go there to play with the orchestra, to do all the orchestra excerpts as a, an audition in the orchestra with mm -hmm. the men. Um, and then you had to do a recital in front of the orchestra. Mm -hmm. That was the audition. Wow. And we are uh, a few selected throughout the world. And uh, I think I did it in January or February, I can't remember. And I got the results in June. So it takes like six months of selection. Oh. Um, so, you know, I would say that uh, because I, I, I mean, I got invited because of YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> but then you have to do the audition, of course. Yeah. But um, I was very surprised, of course, and um, it was a very intense audition to make because you have to do that in one day. Wow. You rehearse with the orchestra. After the rehearsal at one, you play all the excerpts, right. and then you do a recital, and it's like a, it's so tiring. And then you have to play the concert with the orchestra in the orchestra that you don't know. So I would mm -hmm. say it might be more difficult than to play behind the screen in a way. Yeah. And how many how many people were there auditioning when you were there? At this I never knew. Uh, maybe ten at least or fifteen. I can't remember. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know. Brilliant. Um, and one last question, I think, and that is, how has your orchestra been coping with the pandemic? And are things starting up again now, or how are they dealing with it? Uh, like many orchestras, everything was shut down on March seventeen in France. And um, for my orchestra, actually, we were, summer is the moment where we do all the festivals. And of course, all the festivals were uh, closed. So the orchestra has been uh, closed since March. Mm. So we're starting again um, next week. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's the romantic side of it. We're starting again. Yeah. As you might know, the situation is getting worse everywhere. So we are living one day at a time. Uh, the big question is um, 
I mean, their protocol, of course. But my fear is that the day there will be a, corona case, a coronavirus case in the pit, mm. what are we going to do? How yeah. many people in contact, in contact, sorry, will be uh, isolated? Or the orchestra? Mm. All the people around that person, mm. um, etc. So the the woven players have to to play without the mask, of course. But the strings have to play with the mask. Yeah. Um, I think it's a big jump into the unknown. Uh, I have to say, what my 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 fear again is, of course, to be locked down again. But I think no one wants this in with the politicians. I mean, mm. no one. I mean, no country is able to do that again. Mm. Uh, but technically, uh, we have to be prepared that, for example, if we are in, um, in performances for one week of uh, Werther, for example, mm -hmm. if there are too many cases in orchestra, maybe the orchestra will be closed. Yeah. So no performances. Yeah. So the, 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 the length of isolation is seven days in France. So maybe for seven days, there won't be orchestra. Yeah. Uh, I know the protocol, the temperature check, and the artist entrance, uh, mask, uh, gel. Okay, fine, great. But then it's the, the duty of everyone to be super, super careful, not to party, uh, to, to be super serious. Yeah. And when you're a big orchestra, the, you, know, you cannot control everybody. So there are young people, there are older people, etc. So mm. um, nobody knows. I think mm. nobody knows at all. So yet there are protocols, but then there's the spirit of the protocol. So yeah. we will see how it goes. It's if it's it's not depressing. It's not scary. It is what it is. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm trying to stay optimistic. Yeah. And you know the the difference between an optimistic and pessimistic is the optimistic have invented the plane, and the <laughs> pessimistic have invented the parachute. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I'm trying to keep positive. But knowing that uh, if if we if we can play without then without problems for three months until February, it will be a miracle. Mm. So and it's not about France; it's everywhere. Yeah, yeah. everywhere. <clears throat> and when I see my friends, my ex colleagues on, in Los Angeles, yeah, it, they are closed until next year, I think. Yeah. So it's really bad, really, really, really bad. Mm. And some orchestra have started again. I, I have played in July with the Essendon Festival Orchestra with Pablo Yervi, and uh, I played normally. Mm -hmm. No mask, no distanciation. Mm. It was like I went when I arrived, I was so scared because I was like, where are the mask, where are the plexiglass? And no, mm. just stay because the country was very, very actually uh, safe from the virus. So mm. it's great. Mm. Uh, but now it's, I mean, we're all in the same boat, for sure. Yeah. yeah. And actually, what would your advice be for young, well, either students or recent graduates who are sort of starting out in their career and um, have sort of, this is obviously a very difficult time for working and everything. What would your advice be to young players? Um, of course, to stay optimistic. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Even if it if it looks darker, of course. Um, but um, what I think is that if you if you see the lives of composers of great musicians, they, most of the composers composed the best pieces when they were really in the darkest moment mm. of their lives. For example, mm. uh, so many musicians played so fantastically when they were at the darkest moment as well. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that it's the condition to play well, of course not. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, so if if we feel that uh, it's super dark, etc., so let let's play the music even more beautifully than we used to do. For example, um, that's the first thing. And again, if it's your passion, if you're courageous, if you are patient, if you have faith, do it. Do it, do it, do it, do it. But what is sure is that it's a job. It's not a job. But okay, let's say it's a job. Uh, it's a job you cannot do if you don't have this, patient, this, this passion. That's for sure. You cannot make it. And it was, I mean, 20 years ago, for me, it was already like this. Now it's even more. 
So you have to dedicate your life, your time, yeah. to this, to music, to your instrument, to practice, to, to listen to music, to be passionate, etc. That's the only way to get to, 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 to make it. That's mm. for sure. Mm. For sure. There will be very talented people who will make it like this. And there will be talented people, talented, average talented people who will make it and they will have to work a lot. But uh, what is sure again is that people who think that it's, well, they make it, they will handle it. Uh, no, that's, uh, that's not uh, ideal, of course. Brilliant. Oh, you still there, Julian? Oh, yes, I'm here. Lost you a second. Brilliant. Um, I think that's all of our questions. Okay. So thank you very much to everybody who sent them in and huge thank you to Julien for thank you, all, of your, all of your fantastic um, answers and help for everybody who's written in. Um, thank you to everybody who's watching and we'll be back I think I think next week actually. So thank you everyone and see you soon.